When we talk about the least successful video game consoles of all time, the Xbox One is not really in that conversation, selling a respectable 58 million units. But as the years have gone on since that console's life cycle, it's clear some of the events that took place have left a lasting scar on the Xbox brand as a whole. In 2023, head of Xbox Phil Spencer said the Xbox One generation was the worst console generation to lose. In today's video, I want to take a look back at the Xbox One to figure out what exactly happened and what would lead to such a brutally honest quote from Phil Spencer. Microsoft was feeling pretty good after the Xbox 360 generation, and they had every right to. With just their second ever Xbox console on the market, they were able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with industry juggernaut PlayStation. And for most of the generation, they were even able to outperform them. Not only did the Xbox 360 sell extremely well, it is also one of the most beloved and fondly remembered consoles of all time. With its iconic lineup of games and innovative focus on multiplayer gaming and social features, the 360 helped truly establish Xbox as one of the big three, right alongside PlayStation and Nintendo. As they geared up for the reveal of their next console, all they really had to do was build off of that momentum. Rumors first started swirling about this new console around May 2011, commonly being referred to as the Xbox 720 at that time. For the most part, the rumors are what you would expect to see from any new console that we don't know much about. There were the tame, run-of-the-mill rumors about how much more powerful the console would be than its predecessor. Then there were of course the absurdities you would see thrown out there, such as one rumor that claimed the console would have a screen on the controller, similar to Nintendo's Wii U. While these promises of more power alongside some wildly made-up rumors were to be expected, there were some other rumors floating out there that were much more concerning. Talk of Xbox 720 not supporting used games or requiring the use of the controversial connect accessory were heard frequently. Additionally, there was a common rumor stating that the console would be always on, or in other words, would require a constant internet connection to function, even when using features that would typically require no internet at all. Now if there's one thing gamers hate, it's an always online requirement, and I can't blame them for that one bit. Around this time of 2012 and 2013, we saw a few different games try this, and it usually ended up pretty horrifically. The well-documented launch problems that plagued always online games in this era like Diablo 3 or SimCity 2013 13 had left gamers scarred, and so the thought of having an entire console built around this was utterly terrifying. Amidst the panic of these always online rumors, we reached the first major misstep of this Xbox generation. Xbox hadn't commented on any of these rumors, until one day, a man by the name of Adam Orth, who at the time was creative director at Microsoft Game Studios, decided to send out a tweet. In his now infamous tweet, he stated, Sorry, I don't get the drama around having an always on console. Every device now is always on. That's the world we live in. Has Hashtag deal with it. As you can imagine, this tweet sent gamers into an absolute frenzy. Not only did Orth seemingly confirm the feared always online requirement, but his snarky and dismissive tone was especially infuriating. As fans tried to voice their concerns to Orth, he chose to double down. What would happen if my internet went out? Well, the electricity can go out too. What if I live in an area without good internet accessibility? Well, you shouldn't live there. Orth tried to defend these comments by saying he was talking to a friend, and these statements were meant as a joke towards him, not as an insult to others. But with prior tweets coming a few hours earlier using the same talking points which were not directed at that individual, this excuse becomes harder to believe. And even if you remove the privileged statements he made, Orth had still led many players to believe in the always on rumors and caused a major PR nightmare for Xbox. Orth quickly left Microsoft a few days later, claiming it was his decision, but the damage was already done. With Xbox still one month away from officially revealing its new console, it was already shrouded in controversies. As the days moved closer to this reveal event, there wasn't the level of excitement or anticipation you would expect from a new console showcase. Rather, there was an anxious hesitation as fans worried about what Microsoft would confirm to be true from these rumors. With all of the negative press and concerning rumors stacking up against them, it was time for Xbox to speak for themselves and get across their message to gamers on what they could expect from the next Xbox console. On May 21st, 2013, Microsoft hosted the reveal event and what would ensue over the next hour and coming weeks would end up defining the entire console generation. The event was a disaster in every sense of the word, considered one of the worst console reveals in gaming history. They start by showing showing off the console itself and revealing the official name, Xbox One. I've always hated the name of this console, granted I'm a bit biased, as I hate anything that titles itself with the number one after an original has already been released. I think it's confusing and just annoying when speaking out loud. And I mean seriously, try to have a conversation with someone who doesn't know video games about the original Xbox and the Xbox One and tell me they won't get confused. Regardless of how I feel about the One naming structure, the Xbox One was given that name for a very understandable reason. Xbox's goal with the Xbox One was to make it an all-in-one entertainment platform.
platform, home to not just video games, but also your TV, movies, music, and applications as well. This isn't that bad of a concept in theory. Most of the console manufacturers were pushing for similar things or had pushed for similar things in the past. Sony's PlayStation 2 and 3 were famous for their support of DVDs and Blu-rays, making them a go-to entertainment device for many. Even Nintendo was pushing for this around this time, with their short-lived Nintendo TV initiative of the Wii U generation. What I'm trying to say is, the idea of Microsoft wanting their console to be an all-in-one entertainment system is not a strange or bad idea whatsoever. The problem was how desperately they tried to sell it. Microsoft chose to spend the entire first 30 minutes of the event talking about TV, movies, and the new Kinect device. We sat there for 10 minutes watching an Xbox representative yell at the Kinect to switch between watching The Price is Right and sports games, or how you could use Xbox Snap to have both a movie and Bing open at the same time. Again, none of these features are inherently bad, especially Xbox Snap, which probably would have done great in today's era of Zoomers needing three different videos playing at a single time to stay entertained, but did this all really warrant 30 minutes of our time? Not to mention, all of this new tech and features were being built around Kinect, a device that many hardcore gamers had already written off. The Kinect was a strange device, selling incredibly well out of the gate, but having a lot of problems that turned away most players. And at the end of the day, the Kinect was a device that up until this point was seen as something for casual audiences. And casual audiences probably aren't watching an Xbox One reveal event, nor would they be buying a console day one. Regardless, they finally moved on and started talking about games. Keep in mind, we are 30 minutes into an hour-long showcase at this point, and we are seeing a video game for the first time. The games they did finally show were fine, but nothing overly exciting. It was pretty standard stuff like new sports games, a new Forza, and Call of Duty. They did show Halo though, but it was to announce a TV show, not a game. I'm not trying to discredit the games they showed, but it just wasn't enough to make up for the 30 minutes of TV and movie talk that came before it. The worst part was, this event left people with more questions than answers about some of the rumors regarding always-on connectivity or support of used games. As the press asked these questions, many of Xbox's responses seemed snarky and dismissive, almost like they were annoyed that people wanted these questions answered. One particularly infamous moment came when Jeff Keighley interviewed then-Xbox CEO Don Metric and asked him what a player should do if if they don't have good internet access. Matrix's response was to buy an Xbox 360. You can actually hear Jeff fail to hold in his laugh as the CEO of a company unveiling a new product just told consumers to buy the old one instead. Reporters were also able to get them to confirm used games would indeed be restricted by Xbox One. Games would get tied to a user's ID and would then be unable to be sold in the normal ways we're used to. Xbox never got into specifics of how exactly this would work though, claiming they would partner with retailers and or publishers, allowing them to charge a fee for games being played on a second ID. It was all incredibly confusing and frustrating, and Xbox's initial attitude towards this whole thing, as if players were wrong to feel this way, was certainly not helping. The Xbox One reveal had been a total disaster, and we'll talk later about just how harmful this really was, but for now, Xbox needed to keep the ball rolling as they prepared for another major event with E3 2013. I rewatched Xbox's E3 2013 press conference for this video, and honestly, I expected way worse. The conference itself actually wasn't bad whatsoever, ditching all the talk of TV and voice commands for the Kinect. Most of this conference was spent talking about actual video games, and the games shown were pretty exciting, including some big new exclusive game announcements like Rise, Son of Rome, Sunset Overdrive, and Dead Rising 3. Add into that some other major multi-platform games that made an appearance like Metal Gear Solid 5 and The Witcher 3, and this was genuinely a really strong showing from Xbox. Towards the end of the conference, they had the big moment of announcing the price of the console. It was announced that the Xbox One would retail for $499. Keep in mind, this price point was for the console itself, as well as the Kinect accessory which would be bundled with every console, whether you wanted it or not. It had been a few weeks since the controversial Xbox One reveal event, and while those issues still loomed large, Xbox fans were understandably feeling a bit better immediately following this E3 showcase. That is, until it was time for Xbox's competitor to hold their press conference. Xbox fans, I'm sorry to do this to you, but we need to talk about PlayStation's E3 2013 press conference as well, because it is a huge part of this story. PlayStation was also promoting their new console at E3 this year, and their conference started off pretty normal. They showed off new games and features that would be coming to the PS4 console, just as Xbox had done a few hours earlier. But then suddenly something changed. The then president and CEO of Sony Computer Entertainment America Jack Trenton walked onto the stage with a smile on his face he could hardly contain. As he begins speaking, I can only imagine the horrors of Xbox executives everywhere. Trenton begins
begins going down the list of every controversial Xbox One feature we've spoken about and confirms they won't be present on PS4. With every statement he made, the crowd started going crazier and crazier. It's not often you see one of the big three console manufacturers do something like this, especially nowadays, where they publicly call out the competition. In a matter of minutes, PlayStation went from the cocky, arrogant company we had seen during the PS3 generation to now being the company fighting for the people, giving consumers what they wanted. In my opinion, this moment is genuinely one of the most impactful events in gaming history, both for its effect on the gaming scene of that time, but also its effects on the gaming scene we have today. As if this moment wasn't big enough already, PlayStation had one more thing up their sleeves. At the end of their conference, Sony announced the price of the PS4 to be $399, $100 less than the Xbox One. The crowd went wild again, and as the stage lights faded, you could almost feel that PlayStation had just won the generation before it had even officially begun. With Xbox reeling after the embarrassment they faced at E3, it was clear something had to change. And so on June 19th, 2013, just nine days after the E3 fiasco, Microsoft announced a complete Xbox 180. They announced that the console would no longer require online check-ins. Additionally, they would not be placing any sort of restriction on the sale of used games or the act of lending your game to a friend. The gamers had won, their outrage had been heard, and thanks to a little help from PlayStation, Xbox was forced to go back on all of their anti-consumer policies. Unfortunately though, much of the damage was already done. The Xbox One officially released on November 22nd, 2013. Reception to the console was pretty positive all around, and the first few years went decently. But as the generation went on, the PS4 took a commanding lead and never looked back. PS4 was able to double the Xbox One in sales by the time it was all said and done. Now I could sit here and talk about why this happened, but I honestly don't think it's that interesting of a story. The Xbox One had an uphill battle after its controversial reveal, and they were just never able to recover. What I find far more intriguing, and what we'll cover without the rest of this video, is the lasting effect the Xbox One generation has had on the entire Xbox brand. We've seen plenty of consoles come and go, all with varying levels of success, and we've seen countless examples of companies having a miss and then being able to bounce back tremendously just one generation later. But in the case of the Xbox One, it seems that the impact was much more profound. Xbox's current console line, the Series X and S, are also struggling big time, with a recent report stating that the PS5 is outselling them 3 to 1. According to Xbox themselves, the Xbox One generation may be to blame, at least somewhat. The basis for our discussion will be from Phil Spencer's appearance on the Kinda Funny X cast, which aired on May 4th, 2023. If you haven't seen this interview before, I highly recommend you go and watch the whole thing. Phil was very open and honest throughout, in a way that is rare to see from someone in his position. It was here he said, and I quote, We lost the worst generation to lose in the Xbox One generation. Why is this? Well, as Phil himself mentions, most of it boils down to digital game library. The PS3 and 360 generation was the first time we could download full games from digital storefronts, as opposed to going out to the store and buying the disc. However, it wasn't until the PS4 and Xbox One generation that it became more common for people to ditch discs entirely. As we reach the end of that generation, and especially nowadays, there are significantly more people buying their games digitally than physically. What this meant was that for nearly a decade, PS4 and Xbox One users were building giant digital game libraries that they understandably would not want to lose. With the PS5 and Xbox Series consoles being fully backwards compatible, this meant your digital game library would move with you, of course, assuming you stuck with the same line of consoles. And so for most consumers, the decision of which next-gen console to buy was already made. They would be motivated to stick within the same ecosystem, as it would allow them to continue engaging with their digital libraries, instead of having to start all over somewhere new. Unfortunately for Xbox, there were double as many PS4 digital game libraries out there that people would want to stick by. And so once again, Xbox found themselves facing a major uphill battle, having to not only convince someone to buy an Xbox Series console, but also convince that same someone to ditch their last eight years of digital purchases. It didn't used to be this way. Every console was a clean slate, usually with little to no connection to the previous ones. You could go from a Nintendo 64 to a PS2 to an Xbox 360 without much worry, but nowadays there was way more incentive to stick with one brand and ecosystem. And as Phil says, the last generation where switching console manufacturers was viable for most people was indeed the Xbox One generation, the generation that Xbox lost handily. What this has caused is a scenario where Xbox has been forced to play catch up for the better part of 10 years now. And I think almost everything you've seen out of Xbox over the last decade, both good and bad, 
all boils down to this fact. The Xbox brand is in a strange place at the moment. As I'm sure you have all seen, Xbox has begun releasing previously exclusive games on rival hardware like PS5 and Switch. Games like Sea of Thieves or Hi-Fi Rush were among the first batch to make the jump, but we're seeing that list continue to grow, including the recent announcement that Indiana Jones The Great Circle will be coming to PS5 just a few months after its Xbox release. It has started to feel like Xbox is slowly creeping towards becoming a third party instead of a console manufacturer. Is this simply because of the poor sales of Series X and S, or is there something more here? I think a big reason for it is two major major pivots Xbox made during the struggles of Xbox One. The first is their affinity for big acquisitions. Xbox first party games struggled throughout the Xbox One generation, and was a big reason why that console couldn't keep up with the PS4. It was a strange phenomenon, as Xbox had been pretty consistent with their first party output since the original Xbox. And while the Xbox One generation started out decently, things got worse as the years went on. Many first party releases were of questionable quality, and there were long drought periods where players were getting almost nothing. With Xbox struggling to supply meaningful first party games on their own, they looked outward. In 2020, they purchased Bethesda and at that time were saying their games would now be exclusive to Xbox and PC. For the first few years, this held true, with games like Starfield and Redfall skipping rival platforms. Meanwhile, Xbox had their eyes on an even bigger target. In 2022, they announced they would be purchasing Activision Blizzard. Immediately, the questions began of whether this meant games like Call of Duty would no longer be on PlayStation. And at first, Xbox was not committing that they wouldn't make Call of Duty an exclusive. But then the FTC got involved and it was a huge thing, and in the end they made a deal with PlayStation to keep COD coming to the platform. And really, as the years have gone on, it seems that basically none of Activision Blizzard's games will be exclusive to Xbox. Meanwhile, more and more games within Bethesda are not going to stay exclusive either, including the previously mentioned upcoming Indiana Jones game and Doom the Dark Ages. It was a nice power play by Xbox to buy these teams, but in all honesty, I don't think there was any world where they could have realistically kept these games exclusive. And the main reason for that is Game Pass. Game Pass first launched in 2017 during the middle of the Xbox One generation. It was one of Xbox's biggest moves of that generation to try and make a splash. Game Pass is a simple subscription service that grants players access to hundreds of games, but what makes Game Pass different is the inclusion of day one games coming to the service the same day they are released. This included major first party games such as Sea of Thieves and Forza Horizon 4 releasing on Game Pass the very same day they were released for purchase. This was huge, no other company was doing this at the time, and it made Game Pass the absolute best deal in in gaming. I often joke about Game Pass, saying it is literally too good of a deal, to the point where I don't even understand how they're making any money off of it. In fact, Game Pass is such a good deal that if you own an Xbox console, it really doesn't make any sense to not have it. In other words, a lot of Xbox players find themselves very rarely actually buying games, instead just playing everything on Game Pass. In a sense, Xbox introduced a subscription service so good, they accidentally trained their audience to never buy games again. This becomes quite a big problem after acquiring two of the biggest third-party studios in the world, and now having to support them. Game Pass has a ton of subscribers across Xbox and PC, and with them recently raising prices and adding more expensive tiers, Game Pass definitely does make a lot of money. But it doesn't make enough money to support all of Bethesda and Activision Blizzard single-handedly, that's just not possible. And so, Xbox was forced to look for other ways to increase their revenue, leading to the games on rival platforms pivot that we've seen. And so that brings us to the present day. With Xbox console sales struggling and their previously exclusive games coming to rival platforms, many are wondering if Xbox will even be making consoles for much longer. For now, Microsoft's messaging has indicated that they will give it one more go with another new console generation. But if that one fails too, there is a legitimate scenario where Xbox no longer makes consoles, and instead goes the route of Sega. It's pretty interesting to lay it all out like this and see it this way. The massive miscalculations Xbox made during the reveal of the Xbox One led to a deterioration of the Xbox brand and a failed Xbox One generation. This failed generation led Xbox into the Game Pass and Acquisition era, two things that actually don't mix together very well at all. This very thing has cornered them into a position where they're forced to act more as a third party than they had ever anticipated. I find this timeline and story incredibly interesting, and I am so intrigued to see where Xbox tries to take things from here. I hope Xbox can find some way to bounce back, because we need that kind of competition in the console space. But for now, Xbox appears to be on a crash course to become a third party publisher. Ironically, they would probably make more money doing so, as they would genuinely become the biggest third party publisher out there in an instant. But will they dare to make that drastic of a decision, or will they continue floating along as they are now, making consoles while sprinkling more and more games onto rival hardware? Only time will tell.
But for now, I think it's increasingly clear why Phil Spencer said what he said about the Xbox One. Despite performing fine, the Xbox One has had a decade-long lasting impact on every decision they make and every pivot they try to take. And that is why I wholeheartedly agree with Phil that the Xbox One generation was the worst generation to lose.